Okay, I pulled the short straw today. Um, everybody is out, and uh, but it's so wonderful to see you. Brian and Mandy are celebrating their anniversary. I think it's number 17, and uh, they're in Waco. So if you're watching online, Brian and Mandy, hello, good morning to you guys. Um, am I loud? Am I? Am I? Yeah, there you go. And, um, and uh, so uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Nehemiah 2. And how many people have read that book? How many people read it? Okay, good, good, okay. Um, well, over the past few weeks, we've been uh, looking at, oh, you'll probably wonder what this big bottle of water is. Um, my throat is kind of going uh, a little bit, and uh, you may have noticed that in some of the songs, but uh, I'm, I've, I've got my, um, my little list of things to do here. 7 a.m., good morning. 9 a.m., you've got it. Uh, 11 a.m., remember your goal. So um, I'm, at, I'm just at 11 o'clock right now, so I'm, I try and drink a gallon of water a day to get rid of my, uh, my sore throat. But uh, is it anyone else feeling like that? There's some just like allergies going around today and uh, this weekend, this week. Yeah, just me. Yeah. Oh, there's some nodding. There's some nodding. Okay, yeah, coughing. And so I'm going to try and make it without coughing. How about that? If I do, what do I need to do? Like five push-ups or something like that if I do or something like that? Jenny's nodding. Yeah, Jenny's, Jenny's appreciative of that. So... Okay, so over the past few, let's get into God's Word, and uh, enough with me. Um, over the past few weeks, we've been looking at um, the book of Habakkuk. Oh, that's the way I say it. Uh, um, Brian says it a different way. And it's been a timely reminder for us uh, that to keep searching for God, even when it doesn't make sense, and even when we get, to quote Bobby Touch, the warm fuzzies, um, why is this an important reminder for us? Well, the reminder is that God created each of us for His purpose, and it's a part of His plan. And when you come into relationship with Jesus Christ, He begins to define our calling. So how do we discern what our calling is? And some of you might be in that place today. And I want to do something, give something. You know, you're like, you're asking this, I want to be used by God, but I just don't know what to do. I don't know how. So think for a moment about something that really bothers you, weighs on you, an injustice, a need, someone hurting, abused, neglected. Does it disturb you? Does it upset you? Does it make your blood boil? Often as a result of asking these types of questions, it reveals a burden. And maybe a particular group of people or a particular mission of the church begins to develop in your soul and that burden grows stronger and stronger. A pastor from my home church on the mothership in England um, once said to me, if a flame is lit in your soul... For a particular mission or people group or ministry, if that flame becomes a roaring fire in your soul, you may have a calling to those people. On the contrary, if the flame flickers out and dies, it may not be what you're called to. So whose flame in here is lit? Who has a burning passion For a particular group of people? Who has a burden here that they cannot bear alone? Craig Rochelle says the burden you bear often reveals the calling that you'll embrace. The burden you bear often reveals the calling you'll embrace. When you know that you are in the right spot with God and doing what He's asked you to do, Some of you would have already experienced this. There's an overwhelming sense of peace that God brings upon you through the power of His Holy Spirit. And so for some of us, that might mean stepping out of our comfort zone, putting ourselves out there and saying to someone, well, I sense God calling me to serve in this area or that area. Or if it's an idea that you have for ministry or group of people in Mason, pray about it. Talk to others about it. Share your burden with others and see where God takes you because you rarely know when you're on the front end of something really special. 
And this reminds me of a, a ministry that I was a part of in England. There's a picture that's going to come up of, um, uh, there it is, yeah. And uh, that I was a part of in England. It was called uh, the King's Table. That someone in our congregation had a, had a heart for uh, these many folk on our streets who, um, who, were on, who were on the streets of England all, of all ages uh, in a town, or they lived in extreme poverty. They wanted to help, and God gave them a burden for the most vulnerable people in society. Coupled with the fact with Scripture that says to the poor will always be with you and to feed the hungry and clothe the naked. So King's Table was launched. And every Monday and Friday, they offered a lunch meal. And as soon as people found out about it, hundreds of people came to be fed. So that started with a meal. Then that led to Monday church. And there was a group, group of people who wanted to open the scriptures, worship, and listen to uh, a talk and pray for one another before every lunch every Monday. And as a result of one act of obedience of feeding someone in need, people were saved. People were saved. And many of the Monday church members have been baptized and are saved. And they know Jesus as a result of one act of obedience of someone saying, I'm going to feed the hungry. I have a burden for the poor. What an amazing testimony of someone who saw, had a burden and saw life transformation as a result. And you might have, you sitting in this, these pews today, you might have an idea that could change the landscape for someone's life, completely change the trajectory that they are going in. You could be that person. And all the ministries that we have here have a few objectives in mind. One, to see people come into an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. Two, to love people well. And three, to see people fulfill their God-given purpose in their life. So those three things, to see people come into a relationship with Jesus to love people well, and to see people fulfill their God-given purpose. That's what, that's what my heart is for, is, is to see people transformed by the gospel and gone out from here and starting their own ministries. That's, that's my heart. So let's turn to uh, Nehemiah chapter 2 or scroll on your phone if you're on your phone with the Bible app. And uh, we're going to start in chapter 2. In the month of Nisan, and that's not the car, uh, in the 20th century of King, King Artaxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence, and the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins? And its gates have been destroyed by fire. Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when, uh, when I had given him a time, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the king, keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked. For the good hand of my God was upon me. So let's get some uh, let's get some context to this character Nehemiah. Going back in time to the year 587 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, try to do that, say that a, a few times. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. But anyway, I've been practicing that one. And uh, <laughs> he was a very evil king. He led the Babylonian people and attacked uh, Jerusalem. These people completely destroyed the city, the lifestyle, 
the culture, the values. The temple was destroyed, and the Babylonians took the Jewish people into captivity, crushed their spirits, and demoralized them beyond any hope. Does that sound like something that's happening today over in the Middle East? Completely destroyed the lifestyle, the culture, the values. And if you fast forward decades later, some of the Jewish people were finally released from captivity to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the homeland. If you can imagine, they're going, to be, um, they're going back into a demolished city. There's no economic structure, there's no jobs, there's no systems, no government, no leadership. There's no direction, and most of all, there's really no hope. So these early travelers went and tried to rebuild. They hit a dead end, and couldn't, they couldn't get anything going at all. And 140 years after the destruction, an ordinary, everyday guy named Nehemiah was suddenly brokenhearted for the plight of his people and his city. And I want to tell you, he was not a pastor. He was not a priest. He was not a prophet. He was not a contractor, and he, even, he wasn't even verified on Instagram, okay? This guy was just getting going. He was an ordinary servant, a cupbearer to the king. In other words, this guy didn't have any formal or appointed position. All he had was God-ordained passion. And I don't know if this is going to speak to anyone, but... There are some of you that are listening right now, either online or here, that you don't have a, p- p- a position. You haven't been commissioned. But what you do have is passion from God about something that matters. And you know what? That qualifies you. If you have passion for the Lord, that qualifies you to make a difference. <clears throat> Jenny, I'm getting close. Uh, <laughs> So we see from chapter 1, I'm just going to take a quick drink. We see from chapter 1, if you look earlier in the chapter, placing it in context, we see that Nehemiah's heart was broken. And the first thing he did (coughs) was a really manly thing, and he sat down to cry. He wept and mourned and fasted for quite some time. Then he knelt down to pray 12 different times. And in the book of Nehemiah, we see him petitioning to the God of heaven. Then finally, he stood up to act and said, somebody's got to do something about this. And it might as well be me. How do you do the work? How do you make a difference? Well, I want to give you four thoughts today. And we're going to get very practical. And we're going to let the Spirit of God empower us to do the work. And make a difference. So the first thing you want to go and to do is number one is to seek God faithfully. Seek God faithfully. Again and again and again we'll see Nehemiah going before God praying and praying and praying again. In fact let me give you uh, some kind of, of timeline so you'll understand this. If you read the text you're going to see that Nehemiah heard the news about people in the month of Kislev. Now, when in the world is the month of Kislev? That's sometime between, uh, what scholars think, between November and December, our time. And he starts praying, and he prays until the month of Nisan. Not the car. I've probably got some dad jokes about Nisans, but I I won't share those with you. And he prays for the month of Nisan. Sorry to anyone who has a Nissan. Um, that wasn't, that wasn't a dig at you. Uh, this is a, this is four months after Kislev. Four months. But what I want you to notice that for four months he was fasting, he was hurting, he was praying, he was seeking the God of heaven. And why is he doing this? Well, he's asking God to lead his steps. And it's impossible to describe how tricky it would be for a cupbearer to approach the king with a request because the cupbearer's only job is to take burdens off the king, never to deliver the king any kind of difficult news. So for Middle Eastern kings, you would take bad news and never deliver it to them. You didn't want to be the person to ever deliver anything but good news. Have you ever delivered bad news to anyone? It's kind of not, not a nice feeling, is it? Um, we just want to kind of look at the positive. Um, 
And so he's in a very difficult place. And in verse 1 of chapter 2, here's, here's what happens. He describes it this way. He says, I had not been sad in the king's presence before. So the king, he notices, and, and, and the king asks Nehemiah, Why does your face look sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. You see, the, here we see the intimacy between uh, in this relationship. They're so close, the king knows that he's disturbed in his spirit. Verse 4, Nehemiah says, The king said to me, What is it you are requesting? Now watch again. How many times do we see this? Then I pray to the God of heaven. What I hope you'll notice, uh, I hope you'll notice this, that this wasn't a four-day prayer retreat. He'd already had that. This was a man who's walking intimately with God, and now he can just talk to God uh, in in his own way. And so I hope that you'll pray both ways. That you'll pray long and powerful prayers with God so that in the moment you're already close to God and you can send text-like prayers to God. Do you see what I'm saying? So if there's an intimacy, if there's relationship there, you know how we you know, talk if you're in a couple or whatever that you finish each other's sentences is a little bit like that because you know each other really well. It's the same thing with God. If you know his word, if you know who he is, it's, uh, it becomes a lot easier to do. And so you start by seeking God uh, faithfully and walking intimately together. And God, you know, God help. God, give me the words. God, give me wisdom. God, direct my steps. God, show me what to do. God, show me what to say. Has anyone been in that position before where you're like, I have no idea what I'm going to say and I need God to speak. And I need God to help me in this. And there in the presence of the king, the king says, what do you want? And he says, then I prayed to the God of heaven, I answered the king. I hope you remember that about prayer, that there is nothing too big for God in prayer. And there is nothing too big for God's power. And there's nothing too small for God's heart. So when you're approaching God in prayer, just just be mindful of that. We start by seeking God faithfully. Nehemiah faithfully sought after God. And I want to tell somebody here, if you have a heart for something, if you have a vision for something, if prayer isn't necessary for you to accomplish your vision, you aren't thinking big enough. You are not thinking big enough. You want something so big, so full of faith that you need the power of God to come through for you. We often do this when we find out that someone's sick, when someone's got cancer. We don't know what to do other than because it's bigger than what we can handle. And the same as God is wanting to give. He may have already done that for some of you, giving you a vision that is bigger than you can ever imagine. And so what does that do? It gets us on our knees to pray. My prayer is that this church is overflowing with people. Overflowing. I want to see lost people, broken people, who are completely far away from God, completely turn back to Him, and be transformed by the power of His Holy Spirit and by the power of the Gospel. I want to see as many people like that. And then the second thing is, is I want to train them up so they can go out and do the same thing. That's my heart. That is my heart. And I hope you have a heart and a passion for that. Second thing, define the vision clearly. I hope you'll understand, for most people, it's not a lack of caring um, that's your problem. It's a lack of clarity. It's not defining specifically what it is that you're called to. And I want to show you, I want to show you this, I want to, in, in, this, in the scripture here, that there's a crystal clear clarity of an ordinary man with a vision from God. Watch what he says. The king asked Nehemiah, Nehemiah, I see that you're upset. What do you want me to do? Nehemiah says in verse 4, If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let, me, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried. Why? So I can rebuild it. One sentence absolute clarity what did he say please send me to judah 
so I can rebuild the walls. Clarity, seek God faithfully, define the vision clearly. And let me tell you what Nehemiah did not do. And I don't mean to be rude or make fun of anyone, but this is what a lot of people do. They're like, well, he didn't say King you know, Nehemiah, like, what, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? He, you know, he wasn't like fluffy with his, you know, with his response. He's like, well, King, there's something I've been thinking about for a, for a few, you know, a few months. And um, no, he had gone, he had seriously sought after God and he knew exactly the vision that God had for him. And so for most of you, as I said, it's not caring that's your, your problem. It's, it's the lack of clarity. So what do you want me to do? What is God calling you to do? And some of you are going to say, well, maybe let's help children or the next generation, the young people. Okay, help children. How? Which children? Those that don't have their basic needs met? Those that can't read? Those that have been abused? Those that don't have homes? Where? In, your, in this city? In the state? In the nation? In some other country in the world? Do they need medical attention? Uh, what is it that specifically that God is calling you to do and define it clearly? So ask this question, God, what do you want me to do? And he says, please send me to Judah. This is what Nehemiah says, so I can rebuild the walls. In a sentence, what is it that God is leading you to do? Have you ever defined it that way? What is God leading me to do? And maybe he's never said anything to you. Maybe today is the day where you like, need to seek after him and say, okay, what is it that, God, you want me to do? And if your vision isn't clear, then people can't follow. So number one, seek God faithfully. Number two, define the vision clearly. Um, and two more quick points. Three, make plans carefully. And four, inspire people passionately. passionately. So number three, make plans carefully. A goal without a plan is just a wish. We don't want to be those folk that are just wishful thinkers. Oh, I wish it would be like this. I wish it would be like that. Here at F FBC, we want to be intentional with our plans and put the work in to make a difference in people's lives. Nehemiah had a carefully thought out plan. If we turn to scripture again, verses 6 to 8. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates, the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. So this is Nehemiah's plan. He knew, ex he knew when was the right time he was going to go, and he knew where and how he was going to execute his plan and was able to give the king and queen a direct answer. Did it go exactly as planned? What happens if the plan changes to what we think? How do you deal with something not going the way you thought it would? Do we get upset? And this is where we need to realize that the plan doesn't need to be perfect. And if it's perfection that you're seeking, that never works out with our efforts. Jesus was the only perfect man to live on this earth. And God had the perfect plan for our salvation. All we can do is make plans, trust God, and take it one step at a time, hoping and praying that we're doing the right thing um, and praying like mad that God is with you in that. That is my weekly experience at Crew uh, on Wednesdays. And Melissa, I'm sure, at Jam on Wednesdays. You never know what's going to happen. And because uh, you have 70 to 100 kids, just, they don't go wild, they're controlled chaos um, for those parents out there. Um, and uh, but you just don't know what God is going to do through, um, through that ministry until you do it, until you step out. And you might be as, as fearful as, as I was when I, first, when I first got up to talk or lead a song or whatever it may be. What is that step for you? I mean, I, 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 you sharing my experience, like when when I played keyboard for the first time. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a great keyboard player, but I, I kind of fill in. And, uh, but my heart is like, 
and you think, no, no, you're not. Yeah, yeah, I am. And, uh, and because, uh, because I want to worship God and I want to do it uh, in a way that glorifies him. And so um, that's, some of you might be there, but once I got over that, once I got over my heart beating out of my chest, then you can be, and once you've done it that first time and you've said it or you've done it, there's, there's real freedom in that. So lastly, number four, inspire people passionately. When you do what you want to do and when you, when you do it passionately, you're going to have opposition, hardcore critics, haters. We see that time and time again from Scripture. And we're going to see, if you step out in ministry, you're going to see some really discouraged people that feel like God may not be with us. We're failing. We're not getting it done. We could never, ever accomplish this. They're distracted. Has anyone like, opened their own business, started their own business, felt like that? Felt like, or if you're coaching a team and you're like, we just had 10 losses in a row. We've practiced hard, hard, you know, and nothing, nothing, no change. Feel discouraged. Feel distracted, exhausted, feel like failures. And we're going to watch again and again as, as you look through Nehemiah. Nehemiah is such an encouraging book, and I, imp- I encourage you to, to read it uh, after uh, this week. He steps up, Nehemiah steps up again and again and reaches deep within his soul at times when I'm thinking he probably doesn't even know if he believes it's possible himself. And so whenever you stand up for whatever faith you, you might have and you try and inspire people passionately, it's because I believe that all things are possible with God. And so watch what Nehemiah does. He says to them, he acknowledges that things aren't Good. He says, you see the trouble we're in? You know, he's been being real, being authentic. He doesn't sweep anything under the carpet. No, you see the trouble that we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and the gates have been burned with fire. Then what does he say? Come, everybody, people who believe, people from our homeland, people of the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, our God. Let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. Then Nehemiah says, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king said to me. God is with us. God is working. God is for us. Inspire the people around you to believe that God is for what we're doing, that God is with us. He'll never leave us. He will never forsake us. He is empowering us. He's going before us. He's opening doors that we don't have the power to open. He's giving us favor with the hearts of people. Our God is with us. Inspire people passionately. And I like what John Wesley said, who was the founder of the, uh, the Methodist church. He said, light yourself on fire with passion and people will come from miles to watch you burn. Watch you burn. Now, us British folk, we're a little bit like boring and reserved, okay? And so I've had to learn to be a little bit more expressive in the American culture. Um, and so I am pleading with you because the, you Americans are so pumped up, you're so excited, and I love being around you. You give energy, and you don't, you, you know, you don't even know, you don't even know it, but you, you're so there's there's so much energy and joy. That, that you bring as Americans, and, and I'm not trying to like separate us, and we're all together. I'm a I'm a Brexit now, and so, um, but there is some like when when Americans come over to England, they're just so positive. They've got amazing white. You've got amazing white teeth. Uh, we have yellow teeth in England, um, and so, um, but it's it's it it is. It, but it's because you're passionate, and you're passionate about your country, and that. That is exciting to be a part of, um, but, but what's more important is being passionate for Jesus. And that, that sometimes gets in the way, but being passionate for Jesus, that is something where we have common ground. That is something where Jesus has grabbed a hold of your life, and, and you want as many people to know about that as possible. And so John Wesley says, light yourself on fire with passion and people will come from miles to watch you burn. 
We are wanting to fill heaven with people who need the grace of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you need to believe that it's possible. So you may know someone who needs that grace in their lives. What do you need to do? Invite them. Love them. Let some crazy folk here at at First Baptist show them the unconditional love of Jesus. A Jesus who has changed all of us. Get them into the presence of God. Go pick them up. Go say, no, you're coming with me. You're going to come with me. And we're going to go worship God together. And for any of you who think someone's too far from the reach of God, there is no person that God's Spirit can't touch and bring them in a moment. In a moment. If God can create the universe, if God can create the world, He can bring an individual to Himself if He wants to. So what do you care about? What do you care about? Let it break your heart to the point where you just can't keep it to yourself anymore. Where it just oozes out of you. Not with this anger that turns people away, because that's so off-putting when you're angry about something. But with a passion that draws people in and says, come on, let's go on this journey together. We can rebuild. We can save our people no longer in disgrace. So that question that it's going to have, have up here is, what burdens you? What burdens you? Maybe we can empty foster homes and get kids in good homes. We can help people be free of addictions. We can save marriages from divorce by teaching the truth of God's goodness. We can help people heal from what's in your heart. Believe that and inspire people to it. Nehemiah says, I told him about the favor of our God and how he moved the heart of our king. What you care about, that burden, what if it's not an accident? What if God trusted it to you? Because it bothers you more than it bothers everyone else. Maybe it's because you've been given an assignment that no one else has. The burden that you bear often reveals the calling that you will embrace. The burden you bear often reveals the calling that you will embrace. An ordinary person, you don't feel qualified, don't feel prepared, congratulations. You are the perfect type of person that God loves to use. So how do you make a difference? How do you do the good work? You seek God faithfully. You define the vision clearly. You make plans carefully. You inspire people passionately. And you step out and do what you can do and watch God do more through your steps of faith than you ever imagined. Let's pray.